Okay. So thank you to everybody who came today. We really appreciate you being here. Hope you'll walk away with something new. My name is Carrie Price. I'm the Research Impact and Health Professions Librarian at the Cook Library at Towson University. And I'll let Miranda introduce herself. Yes, and my name is Miranda Fair. I'm the Publishing and Open Scholarship Librarian, also at the Cook Library at Towson. And um, so the point of today is to talk about how to make our work visible. We're going to cover some different scholar profiles and persistent identifiers, mainly ORCID. We'll talk about the Lens, um, which is a scholarly search engine. Scopus, which you might be more familiar with. Google Scholar, which you're probably very familiar with. Um, we'll talk about a bit about impact um, and sharing your work, and then sort of wrap up with talking about the scholarly publishing landscape in general and how the library can help you. And feel free to send questions into the chat mm -hmm. or um, unmute yourself to ask a question, and we'll do the best we can to answer those. And the first thing I wanted to talk about was ORCID and then kind of pair it with the lens. So ORCID is Open Researcher and Contributor ID. I explain it as kind of a social security number for your research. It helps you keep track of your research output across your lifetime. And even if you change names or institutions, it will help you um, disambiguate your work from others and share your work. People are submitting their ORCIDs along with manuscript submissions. They're putting it on their academic CVs. And in fact, it can help you build your CV. And it is a non, um, let's say it's an agnostic consortium. It's not affiliated with any one institution. So what I'm going to do is show you ORCID.org. And I'll drop a link in the chat in a minute. If you already have one, you might be familiar with how it works. If you don't have one, you can sign in and register. I'm going to use myself as an example since I can sign in as myself and I'll just click sign in. If you didn't have one, you would click register now and fill out a little bit of information. And I should mention it's a free tool. So you have lots of options here. You can add your name, you can add and edit your bio, you can add and edit your employment, um, your education, your invited positions and distinctions, any memberships or service that you participate in, any funding that you've received, and any of your works. Now, at any point, when you add them, you can make them visible to anyone who views your profile, to trusted parties, or to only you if you're just keeping the record for yourself, but it's something you don't want people to necessarily see, you can change that and you can edit it with the pencil icon. So you could type in here what you needed to type in. Now down under works, you can add your scholarly works and they don't have to be academic journal articles. They can be conference presentations. It can be books and book chapters. And let's see, you just click on add. You can search and link, which is probably one of the easiest ways to do it. You can add a PubMed ID if your work gets indexed in PubMed, the digital object identifier, a bib tech record, or you can add manually. When you add manually, um, let's see here. Um, when you add manually, you have an option to select a work type. So it can be pretty much anything probably even other. I'm not sure if there's an other. So I'll close that. You can also add by searching and linking in Scopus. We'll talk about Scopus a little bit later. Scopus is a huge multidisciplinary platform and you can search and link through Scopus to find works that have been published and then link them on your profile. So it'll link up with you. It'll say, is this you? And if your name is really common, this might be helpful for you to um, disambiguate your work from another, say, um, Bob Jones or something like that. Now, let me get back to Orchid. You know how Zoom always like takes over the top of your screen.
Any questions about ORCID? Once you've filled it out, you can grab this link here and add it to your academic CV, your scholarly record, put it on your profile at work or your email signature, and it helps people look at your record and see what you've published. So let me just look at what the public looks like, what the public version looks like. And here you can see how it appears. You also have the option to add some professional links in your email. I've had people contact me and find me that way, so that's kind of nice. Now, going hand in hand with ORCID is the Lens, which is a new research platform out of Australia. And actually, um, I'm not really sure who's behind it. And it's it's really made its way onto the into the scholarly communications world in the past couple of years. So you can search for patents and scholarly works, but one of the coolest things is profiles. So let me show you what you can do here with profiles. You can look up somebody that you're following or that you want to keep track of. So maybe a professor you work with, faculty, um, and I'll just use for an example, Anthony Fauci. It doesn't matter if you use first name, last name, or last name, first name, you can look them up. And we don't see him, and the reason is because he has not maintained his ORCID, so he probably hasn't logged into ORCID and done anything with it. So let's uncheck this. We don't care if he's maintained his ORCID. We still would like to see his scholarship profile. And I'll click search, and there we get Dr. Fauci, who we know is probably this guy, director from the National Institutes of Health, and we can click on his record. So it works better if, if someone has an ORCID and has linked it up to their ORCID. But let's let it load. It does take a minute or two, not a not a literal minute. Let's see what happens. Oh, while it's loading, you have an ORCID question in the chat. Oh, let me pull up the chat. Oh, gosh. Is there any case where a researcher shouldn't use ORCID? Peter, thank you for that question. I may be biased, but I would say no. It's It's not... Um, I can't see any case where you wouldn't want to use your ORCID ID, or your open researcher and contributor ID because it's only helping to establish your profile and help people find your work. Miranda, do you have an opinion on ORCID? Not that differs. Okay. Yeah, if anything, yeah. We see a little bit about Dr. Fauci here, patent, scholarly citations, his H index, and he has 44% of his scholarly works are open access. Let me show you the difference when someone links their ORCID. So I've linked my ORCID. I'll show you myself. We'll go back to the lens.org. We'll go to profiles and we'll try me. That's me. Uh, Patty asks if people include ORCID IDs in the actual publications. Some journals are asking for your ORCID when you submit. I would say to try to submit it in some way, shape, or form so that it can be linked. Um, I think it's the new standard for journals to have your ORCID available when you get published. So sometimes you'll see a little green ID button next to the author's name, and that links to the ORCID. So here it's pulling information from my ORCID and it's telling you my employment, my education, my co-authors. And what I think is really cool is some of the altmetrics material that it offers you. So if you've been mentioned in, on Facebook, if your work has been mentioned in Wikipedia, Google or Twitter, Weibo, it can show you exactly those pieces where it was mentioned. So if I clicked on tweets, I could go right to that tweet and find where my work was mentioned. I also get the summary stats here, or 46% 40, of my scholarly works are open access. I didn't plan that. That kind of just happened. And then if you scroll down, you can see the works themselves. And there's so many great links in the lens to get to the works, but that's probably a topic for another day. And the way that I linked it up was when I first logged in, there was a little icon that said, is this you? If so, log in and link your ORCID. That's all I had to do. I added my little profile picture and it's all set to go. So with this link, I can copy it and share it 
just as well as I would share my orchid. Any questions about orchid, the lens? I see more. Uh, Shauna said orchid can be used by bad actors in paper mills, but no, of course we wouldn't do that. And these slides are just here to kind of show you what we're going to be going through. So the next one is Scopus. This is a subscription database. I know we have people here from Towson University, and we do have access to Scopus. If you're from another university, you might want to check and see. I'll show you where to find it through Towson. So here's the Towson Library website. And if you go to databases, we have almost 400 different databases for everything from science to music to computers, math. And I will just look for Scopus here. And then I will just log into Scopus. And here you can search for literature the way that you would normally search for citations, for evidence by using documents. And they have some other options here too. But under authors, you can find, link, and use your researcher profile. And this time we really will use Dr. Fauci. So F-A-U-C-I. And we can just put the first initial because maybe there's a couple we wanna see which one's which. So this may happen to you if you had a, a more common name and we see 16 A. Fauci's, we can tell that most of them are not the Dr. Fauci in question. So let's just look through. This might be also him and it's just not been merged. Um, but let's go with number one. So once you find the researcher that you'd like to view, you click on their name. If you wanted to view their documents, you would click on their documents. Let's click on his name. And it does take another moment to load. But I really like, because Scopus is so large and multidisciplinary, I really like that it seems very representative of the work that a person has done. So again, he hasn't connected it to an ORCID, his Open Researcher and Contributor ID. If this were me, you can edit the profile slightly if I had changed jobs or anything. If you wanted to follow this person, you can create a free Scopus account and set an alert. And then here you can see the document and citation trends over time. And it, it's very interactive, which I think is one of the great strengths of Scopus that if I clicked on 2011, I would see just the 13 documents associated with 2011. On the right, we see his most contributed topics in the past couple of years. And then if we scroll down, we see all the 1,100 documents. Now, like I said, that's representative, but it is limited by what's indexed in Scopus. But many, many things are indexed in Scopus. So they have started to index preprints. So if we looked at preprints, we can see all related to COVID. There were three preprints with Dr. Fauci as an author. He has 2,316 co-authors you could explore. 45 topics and awarded grants. And that's a beta feature. So this is something you could use also if you were to submit a Scopus ID. That's just another unique number for your research profile. And it may be something worth including in your CV. Um, I'm trying to think. There's usually, oh, I remember if we wanted to see the documents and uh, we'll view list in a search results format. I'm getting into analytics a little bit here too, but I think it's important because you might be doing this on yourself and your own impact. So here's 1100 results from Dr. Fauci. If you analyze the search results, Scopus gives you a dashboard of some pretty nice visualizations. So we can see when he was most active as a researcher. We can interact with this list. 
we can see the journals. So we'll click on this tile. It comes up to our main tile and we can see where he's published the most. Who he's published with, in what countries, what kinds of documents and in what subjects and by funding sponsor. So if this were you, this might give you a good visualization or breakdown of your own work because it can be hard to keep track. Any questions about Scopus? Let me close that. And then Miranda is going to show you Google Scholar, another platform where you can have a profile. So let me stop share. And I will start sharing once I figure out which tab it's on. Okay, um, can you all see my screen now? Is Google Scholar. It's not like my email or anything. I always get paranoid with the double monitor. Looks okay, good. so Google Scholar, um, is it the best scholarly search engine? Probably not, but um, it's everywhere and a lot of people use it. So um, I think it's, it's important to have um, like all of your articles linked on here if you're able to. Um, so you can search topics, articles, but you can also look for, for people in here. So we're going to look up Carrie again because hers is robust. So it'll give you um, articles that were written by that person, but up here it'll usually say um, user profile. They have one. Um, in this case, um, it'll give you affiliation, what's the, uh, if you've got a verified email from there, and then some topics that they publish on a lot. Um, so it'll also give you the list of the publications that are in here. Um, some Zoom window. Okay. Some um, citation metrics, so just like a number of citations. Also the I-10, which is a, a Google Scholar thing. Um, there's also, um, this is shown up in the past couple of years, which is this public access section, which I think is interesting. So this is based on um, what funders um, of the research are requiring, whether you make it public access or not. So it'll show you how many are available on here and how many aren't. Um, you can also see past co-authors, which if you're looking at other people that you want to collaborate, you can see who they've collaborated with. Um, and I guess the reason you would want to set this up um, is because, again, a lot of people use Google Scholar. If you want more people reading your work, this is a, a good way to do it. Um, if you don't have your own profile, this should show up. If you're looking at anybody else's, you can also um, just go to the, the hamburger menu under my profile. I'll ask you to set one up. So um, if you're logged into Google, it'll know that, but it'll have you do your verification email, fill this out. Um, and then it'll have you go through and look at, um, it'll pull a bunch of articles that have your name. Google isn't as amazing as some other places at like figuring out which Paul Smith you are, if that's your name. So it's important to kind of go through. Um, the other thing about Google too, is that we don't, know exactly what it's searching. It seems to be really good at getting articles off the internet. And like, we see that they have articles in journal, but they don't make the information about like, which issues of the journal they're pulling from available. Um, Cause Google doesn't like to tell us how it works. We know that's just how they are. Um, so in some cases you might have something published, maybe Google Scholar doesn't search through older issues of a journal. It might not be in there. Um, but I think that is why it can be important too, because I know they're very good at finding things in institutional repositories and they're very good at finding things um, online if you've posted your articles online. Um, sort of generally, I say the more places you have something, the more likely it is to be found by other people. And um, there are uh, some ways, more than one way to share them. Um, that's basically all I have to say about Google Scholar. So I'm going to go over to Sherpa Romeo because you might be wondering, like, what am I allowed to share and where um, if you have a published article? So um, Sherpa Romeo, which I always want to say Romeo, even though I know it's not that, um, is a resource where you can um, look up different open access policies from um, publishers that you have and like uh, published with and what they're um, archiving policies are because they they can vary by journal. So you can search by publisher by journal. 
I'm gonna search. Oh, and this you can just get to. Um, it's I can put the link in later. Um, it's they've added more things. They also have something called Sherpa Juliet now, which has you look up like research funder policies, which can be really helpful because a lot of them are requiring that you publish open access now. Um, so we'll just look up the Journal of Academic Librarianship because I know it's in here. And it's pretty robust. So if you search by title, it should take you um, to the page. It'll give you some information about the publication, who publishes it, what kind of publisher they are, um, and then what their policies are. And that's that's where we get into this. I like this because it has a lot of different examples of what you're allowed to do. So let's say you publish an article in here um, and you, so you want to post the published version. Um, these different pathways tell you what you can do with the published version, so A through C. So these little icons will mean different things. So we have the pound sign here, and if you click and expand it, it will show you what. Um, so we know that this one has an open access fee associated with this. So this is a gold open access journal. Um, it does include open access publishing. There's there's no embargo. They tell you what kind of license that you have to put on there, um, and they tell you like where you can put it. Um, so basically it can just go on the journal website. Um, you can put it in, it might be indexed in PubMed Central, depending on the topic, um, in a non-commercial repository and that you have to acknowledge it with a citation. Um, but that this is if you've paid the open access fee um, and it'll tell you like where to put it. Um, so you can also, this is more or less the same thing, um, but, this this has a CC by license instead of a CC by um, non-commercial no derivatives. So this last version has this um, prerequisite. So this you'll see a lot like prerequisite funders. So if any of these were your funders, they are requiring that you publish open access. So that's if this is the pathway that applies to you, um, it tells you what you need to do with it here. Now, most of that is kind of out of your hands. So let's say you wrote the article and submitted it. They're putting it on the journal website for you. Um, you're allowed to share it if you paid the fee or had someone pay the fee for you or the funder did. Um, what you can do is um, do things with your accepted version or with the submitted version. Um, so this would be more likely what you'd want to put in an institutional repository um, like the one we have here. Or if you're at a different institution, you probably have one too. Um, or if you want to put it on your personal website. So this will tell you, yeah, so published version, these two are for accepted version, and this is for the submitted version. Um, so the other things that kind of show up here, um, like there were, there's no embargo on any of these, but you will see here that this little like hourglass um, has a 12 month embargo on it. So this one's saying you can immediately post the accepted version um, so that'd be like the non-publisher formatted version on, on your homepage. You have to link to the published version with the DOI, um, but I think they do a pretty good job of explaining what you have to do. Um, if you wanted to put this in a non-commercial institutional repository, which would probably be a university one um, or a subject repository, um, it says, and it requires that you publish using this specific Creative Commons license. Um, and there's a there's a function in at least in DSpace and probably most in the repositories that allows you to just select the license. Um, but it can't hurt to add that in the footnote if you want, or just yeah, in the footnote of the page if you want. Um, but pay attention to this embargo bit because I don't I don't know if they'll come after you, but they probably could. So make sure you wait uh, 12 months after publication before doing this. Um, usually there's not a lot of rules about what to do with the submitted version because this will just be what you wrote. It won't have been reviewed yet. They just kind of let you do what you want with that. But there are some places you can put it. Um, and in this case, they have links to um, different, like more information about how to attach a user license, what the sharing policy is, things like that. Um, and then if you click on, yeah, the publisher, it'll, it'll take you to that. And it also give you the URL to it there. Um, so I find this useful because all this information is also usually available on the publisher page, but sometimes you have to read through many paragraphs. Um, personally, I find this a little easier to parse um, where they just kind of pull the relevant information. Um, now, if you, while we're on here, we can look at Sherpa Juliet. So this is just another thing that they have. Um, so if you're like have a research funder and you don't know what you have to do with it yet. Now that Google's pulling this, I think people are more aware of it. So let's say Wealth and Trust is funding your research. Um, 
it'll basically explain to you that it does require open access archiving and it'll tell you what you can archive like what what versions of it um when you can so in this case it's the date of publication um saying they want it in these named repositories and any licensing conditions and then like special conditions that you might have to do so you might have to submit it into a specific repository like in this case you have to and you have to put in PubMed central um so this is useful to use um then i think that is about what i have for this so i'll go back to the, the powerpoint while we're talking about publishing we can keep talking about it if it's gonna let me present Yes. No. Is it just black? Okay. It's not showing up for me. Oh, good. This page is slowing down Firefox. Well, love a technical difficulty. Would you mind sharing again? Just because it doesn't seem to want to let me. Sure, let me do that. I should have just opened it in PowerPoint so on the web. Um, so kind of while we're talking about publishing, we'll continue to talk about just what the scholarly publication landscaping is in landscape is in general, because I've talked a bit about open access. I feel like I've thrown those around, but I guess we'll talk about why you might want to do it or what it actually means okay next slide um so just sort of looking at how things are obviously it's a it's a massive industry so the um publishing market is a very large billions of dollars industry um and they have a pretty wild profit margin um almost about 35 percent this is um there are a lot of articles that will say this this one's from 2018 um because i mean they're not most of the stuff isn't on print anymore. They're just selling very expensive access um, to these articles to the people who are writing them in a lot of cases. Uh, next slide. So here's just a, a visual graph um, to kind of helps you see like how much is being spent on um, zero cost, especially compared to monograph expenditures versus monographs purchase, which has remained, I guess, relatively consistent compared to um, how far they've gone up for um, periodicals. Um, so this is just sort of a visual representation of a, a paywall we've all probably reached on a news website. In this case, it's for the Los Angeles Times. Um, they say you've reached your free article limit and they want you to subscribe to continue reading. Um, next slide. There is a version of that, which is um, articles that um, see they're going to say your institution doesn't have access to this. Um, it'll say you can purchase this PDF for this price. Um, I mean, generally, we want more people to see our work. We don't want it behind a paywall. Um, then next slide. Um, so the way around that is to make it open access. There's a few re wait, reasons you might want to make something open access, kind of how we were discussing before. A lot of funders are requiring it now, um, at least some version of it. Um, there is also the open access citation advantage, which people have been talking about for a while. This particular um, systematic review is, was trying to see if the advantage was actually real. So they looked at um, the citation, uh, our studies that looked at the citation of open access and subscription-based articles. Almost half said yes, that they um, found that there was an advantage. 27.6 um, did not find an advantage. Um, some found it in subsets, so like certain disciplines there was and other ones there wasn't. One study was inconclusive. Generally, they found that studies that looked at multiple disciplines were more likely to find an open access citation advantage. So um, it can't hurt is a good conclusion. Um, so there's different types of open access. Um, I feel like I've been throwing around the terms gold, green, et cetera. I'll just go over them briefly so we know. Gold open access is what you are going to see a lot of the time. These are sort of the commercial publishers um, that are so like the big name ones like Elsevier and Wiley that are charging um, an article processing charge. So they're charging the author 
to make their article open access um, so that others don't have to pay to read it. Um, whereas in traditional subscription-based articles, you have to be affiliated with some kind of institution or pay the $30 for a PDF, but I don't, I hope no one's actually doing that um, to read as an individual. Um, green open access, as I did mention before, um, is that that'll be yourself archiving it. Um, usually in an institutional repository, might be in a subject repository. Um, hybrid is kind of tricky. So hybrid journals are partially subscription-based access, partially um, open access, but they do charge um, uh, article processing charges. So uh, basically the publisher is making a lot of money on the same content because they're charging both of the authors to make it um, open access and also charging people to um, get, charging like libraries to be able to read it. Um, bronze, you don't see as much. Basically, that's just something that's freely available, but usually it's not um, licensed very specifically. So you're not sure whether it can be shared. You don't know if it can be reused or derivatives can be made of it. Um, you also tend to be less sure of like whether it'll stick around forever because they might not have um, like an archiving policy in place. Diamond OA, hopefully we'll see more of that. Those are, um, they are open access, but they don't charge authors to make them open access. They just don't have fees. Usually they have some kind of philanthropic background. The one I don't have on here is illegal open access, which isn't really open access. It's just pirated articles. I'm not saying to do that. You shouldn't do that, but they're out there. So I thought it was worth mentioning. Um, okay, next one. Oh, so how can the library help? All right, so we do have a number of tools available through the library to help you make decisions about where to publish, how to publish, and to understand your impact in your field. And I'll go over just a couple of them today. Um, actually, Miranda already talked about Sherpa Romeo, which I'm always also going to say Sherpa Romeo. I don't know why. Um, and then I'll stop sharing because Cabels is a subscription database that we have access to. So let me stop there. No, I will go back to sharing if it wants to cooperate this time. Yeah, I'm having some technical difficulties today. Okay, is it is it showing us? The... Yeah. Yay, okay. So um, we have a link to it um, in our database list, which is where we got the, the link to Scopus. Um, so it's under C. They have um, it listed as journalytics and then predatory, predatory reports separately, but if you open it, you can tab between them pretty easily. Um, so they'll be up here. Um, journalytics is if you're wanting to see like what's up with a specific journal you want to publish in. We'll just stick with the journal of academic. One thing I found kind of annoying about this is it automatically sorts alphabetically by title. Um, so even if the thing you're, you can, you can choose, but even if the thing you're, so this might make more sense if you're looking journals to publish in and you want to search by subject, you can kind of see what sort of all metric report they have on here, time to publication, that sort of thing. Um, but it'll automatically do it individually so you, or alphabetically. So even if this is what I'm looking for, it doesn't show up first. Um, so it'll give you some information about it. If you click on this, you'll see that they, how often they publish, that they allow for green open access. Um, some of these are more robust than others. Um, I know this one has a bit, so it'll tell you the launch date, give you more information about it, the link to what the manuscript guidelines are, which is helpful, um, kind of how you submit, what the percentage of invited articles are. They don't all have an acceptance rate, but this one does. Sometimes they'll say um, like what the guidelines are, what um, citation style you're supposed to use. Um, and then they have this section about the review and they'll usually give you an estimated um, time to review, time to publication, whether or not they're using plagiarism screening and then um, visit to journal website. They also have this feature on here where they kind of look at like, it's their classification index. So it's what, what subjects and disciplines um, that 
one publishes. So in this case, it's just education, technology, and library science. But in some cases, there might be a lot. Um, so this one has five. So we'll tell you like how many of each, and it seems to be split between these different subjects. Um, Sort of the other side is the predatory reports. So um, not everything shows up in here. What's nice is they have a list of journals that are currently under review, which I think is just going to make me download an Excel spreadsheet. So I won't I won't make you look for through that right now because it's very long. Um, and they'll list the different violations. Um, so in this case, I'm going to search by discipline because you can. We'll do library science. Um, and we'll pick one with a lot of violations so I can show you the different ones that they have. Um, it's helpful if you're thinking of publishing somewhere, especially a journal you're not as familiar with, to see if they show up on here. And violations vary a lot in, in severity, I'd say, but it's still good to look. Um, if they show up on here, that's usually not great. Um, so it'll tell you what the access level is when it was last reviewed, um, what the subject is, and then they list them by um, subject. So um, they'll talk about whether they obscure relationships with a for-profit partner company, which is not great. Um, in this case, they don't seem to do a lot to check for plagiarism. They don't have any uh, policies. And some of these cases, it might just be that the website is lacking sufficient information, but I probably would not submit to a journal whose website is lacking this information anyway. Um, if they don't listen to an editorial board, um, they don't have a clearly stated peer review policy. Um, so they're missing, they might be missing articles altogether. They don't have a lot in the archives. Um, usually not having a physical address or a fake address. It's probably not great. Um, poor spelling or grammar. Um, and then this one doesn't have a policy for digital preservation. Sometimes there's more in that section. Um, but it's interesting to see why they're on here and why they could end up here. And it's a good tool. Um, I know it's, it's not completely comprehensive. I would probably still check multiple places, but mm -hmm. um, that's just what I do anyway. It's a good practice to be in, I think. Um, cool. I will probably stop sharing. Oh, I have a question. There's a question in the chat. Scraping my AI LLMs. Um, I don't know what LLM stands for. Uh, Not in this case, anyway. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt. So, no, it, it, language learning models. So, chat oh, GPT okay. is one so of them. This would, be, so. this would be our chat GPT, et cetera. Oh, because, like, yeah, they're, they're not, you, you can't stop them with a CC by license that they're going to pull content from it anyway. Yes, this feels like a, at least new to me challenge that I haven't really mm -hmm. thought of. Um, because, yeah, we don't know. We just know they're pulling information from things that are publicly available. Um, that is really interesting. I'm going to think more about that. Yeah, it's all new to me. I'll just note, I'll just note for our medical people here that Cabell's has a separate health and medicine product that they're oh, yeah. selling separately, which I think is kind of a stinker of them to do. But they claim that it's different proprietary search algorithms so if you're looking for health and medicine journals you may not find them in cabals um, and then i wanted to show you just a couple of other tools you can use to discover where to publish so they're listed here um, and i'll just show you that most of the major publishers have some sort of journal suggesting tools so we see wiley and springer let's just look at one and if you were looking for uh, a journal to publish in and you were talking about, um, uh, uh, sorry, let me think of a good one, critical care, rehabilitation, and I'm just making some stuff up, but maybe you have a better title and a better abstract, but these are enough keywords to get the database to um, get some results for you. And mobility, I don't know how many results I have to enter here. Critically ill in the ICU. All right, so we get the point. It's not grading me very well, but we'll look for some journals that might take this. Yeah. Uh, in most cases, you'll probably have a real abstract. Though. You'll have a real abstract. You know what? It's funny because it's worked for me before. Um, but yeah, I, actually, let me just go to PubMed then. 
and just look for critical care. We'll try something else. I'm going to just take some terminology, credit that article and the title, credit to these people, and see if we can come up with a better list here. All right, so <laughs> that's better. And then we get a list of recommended journals that match on those keywords and may be a potential for us to look into. Keep in mind that they're all through Wiley. Now, in the same list, we saw um, Springer Nature. There's one for Elsevier. There's a couple others. And then there's one that's publisher agnostic called Jane, Journal Author Name Estimator. And so we can go here. I'll just uh, enter some of that again. Click Find Journals. And what it's going to show you is, let me make this a little bit bigger. It'll show you if it's indexed in Medline, which can be a quality indicator because Medline index journals go through a um, more rigorous vetting process than just journals that are indexed or showing up in PubMed or PMC. And it'll tell you if it's high quality open access based on the directory of open access journals, which again is a platform that vets the journals to make sure that they're um, reputable. And it'll also show you if it shows up in PMC, which is PubMed Central, the open access archive from the National Library of Medicine. So that's just a suggestion. And then you'd have to go through and look them up yourself and decide if you wanted to publish there. Let me go back. Uh, let's just go to the directory of open access journals. Again, these are vetted and you can search here and you can also search by whether they have an APC or not. So if we wanted to find uh, a good journal, open access journal for critical care outcomes, we can search. And then once we get the results list, uh, we can look for ones that have been vetted by the DOAJ. Oh, wow, I'm really striking out today. 113, so I just needed it to be less. Uh, you can search for ones that have been vetted by the DOAJ and ones that, have, that do not have APCs, ones where the author retains all the rights. Miranda, do you have anything to say about DOAJ? Um, I love a healthy dose of skepticism. So I like DOAJ a lot. One thing to keep in mind is that um, a lot of what they rely on is publisher supplied information. Um, so just remember that. But usually they'll be, um, they'll have, they'll, they'll have things laid out pretty plainly here. Um, but a lot of this is, uh, like publishers will say, I want to add my journal in here and they'll supply a lot of this information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so like, those journals that just got taken down from Web of Science, those MDPI ones that mm -hmm. were putting out like thousands of papers. Um, I know at least one of them has a DOAJ seal. Um, and that's not to say it's horrible just because this thing happened to it. But again, there's there's reasons to be somewhat skeptical. I generally am more skeptical of ones that are charging like very high um, publication fees. Um, not that ones that don't charge publication fees are automatically better, although in a lot of cases they can be, especially if you don't want to pay them or don't have a mechanism for having them paid for you. Um, where was I going with this? But yes, again, it's a good tool. I tend to check multiple places if I can. Um, also, a lot of these are like, it's not kind of automatically indexed, like they're run by somebody who has to like go through and take things down and add them and review them, which is good. But at the same time, if there's like some scandal with a, with a journal, um, it might be a little while before it comes down from here. Um, or sometimes they'll be removed temporarily, investigated, and then either re-added or taken off. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Um, Scopus, uh, uh, Scopus 2, lastly, I'll mention, has some journal analytics really similar to the impact factor that we see in Web of Science, same metrics, uh, very similar. And so when you search for journals in Scopus, you can get an idea of their impact. But also, I think that matters less and less. <laughs> so depending on your field. So those are just some tools. And I put a link in the chat to that page. That's open to anybody. You don't have to be a Towson affiliate to use those tools. And then... Miranda, do you want to talk about the upcoming 
workshops? Yes. So we have two more of these coming up. I'm doing one in a couple of weeks on April 12th at the same time, 11 a.m. Eastern, um, which is about licensing your work with Creative Commons. There will be probably a little bit of repeated content because all of these things overlap, but I'll, I'll talk about Creative Commons more in depth um, and also how to find things that you're able to, to create derivatives of and reuse. Um, or in images. I know people are often looking for images. Um, and then we have another one on deciding where to publish. Um, again, overlap. <laughs> yes, again, there's some overlap, but um, probably go more in depth with some of the tools we just touched on in the end. Um, mm -hmm. So that, that'll be on May 3rd, also at 11. And keep it consistent. And the links are there, but you can find it in roughly the same place you found this one. Yeah. And then we'd like to uh, thank you for coming today. We'd like to take any questions if you have any. And before you leave, we'd really like it if you could fill out a form for us. Let me just um, grab that. It's anonymous, of course. And of course, it's Microsoft giving me troubles. So I'll put a link here in the chat. And then I will also pull up the QR code again. If you could just give us some feedback on our workshops, like I said, it's the first of hopefully many to come. And we'll stick around for your questions. And again, appreciate you spending a little time with us today. Peter, your hand is raised. Sorry, I know I've, I've talked a lot so far today. <laughs> I, I was curious. On. Um, one uh, issue we're running into is that there's a new um, requirement for publicly funded research yeah. that th there needs to be author profiles in um, and I, the NIH platform. I think it's uh, SCI ENCV. Um, yes. And um, so I, I, was, I was curious about how that, that platform relates to others you've discussed. This seems like ORCID is the most interoperable oh, yeah. one, and, and, uh, but just your experience with advocating for authors appearing on multiple platforms and how mm -hmm. much extra work that is and how it's hard so, to convince them. Good question that caught me off guard. I feel like Sci and, v, Sci and CV is limited to people in health medicine and trying to get grants from NSF or NIH. Also, the it's a little bit archaic, so usually you need it when you want to do a grant. But more and more, I believe that the NIH is requiring you to have a, I almost said a COVID, an ORCID, um, an ORCID profile. So when you submit your grant, they want to have want you to have an ORCID profile, and I'm not sure if that's required or just strongly encouraged. Uh, the the Science EV BioSketch, which is what people use for grant applications for NIH, is pretty archaic, and I, I think it only lets you like keep three or four active works, and the rest are all um, the rest are all hidden. So I'm not even sure it's stayed up to date with the way that things look. And in fact, you can see I've linked my ORCID here because these are so old. Um, I haven't messed with it since April 2022. The other thing that those public access policies are, do are doing, and I wanted to mention that when Miranda was talking about embargoes, is mm -hmm. I'm wondering if we'll see those embargoes go away over time because that's one of the new requirements. Um, you, you can link to your ERA Commons, which is what you use for your grant. This is my public URL. I really think ORCID's just taking over the field here. Because let's see what it looks like. It's not even really working. It's, it might be me, it might be my browser. Oh, yeah, so, so you'd submit this along with your grant. I would load four citations that had to do with the grant and um, usually a couple of paragraphs about my contributions to science regarding the grant. So that's all I know about 
bio sketch. Have you used it differently, Peter or Miranda or anybody? We're sort of just my my library at the University of Kansas Medical Center. We're we're approaching this more from a, a request of meeting compliance with federal funding <laughs> standards. And there's a I believe the deadline in October where it 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 has to be the way that that the author officially reports their profile. But that's an interesting point about the the orchid tie-in that maybe orchid would would be a good first step for wherever you go next to just as a um, kind of the central spoke of whatever whatever wheel you want to create around your author identity online. Yeah, actually, yeah, I'll have to look into that. I didn't know. I, I haven't heard much about Biosketch and Science CV lately, so I hadn't heard about requirements. <laughs> it's funny that I just didn't mention it. I probably should have mentioned it. <laughs> Well, if nobody has any questions, um, please don't forget to take the survey and we'll let you get back to maybe your lunchtime or something. And we'll see you hopefully the next time we have a workshop. Thank you, everybody. I'll Thank you for coming. Stop the recording and close the session.